Australia has a reputation for its dangerous wildlife. Venomous snakes, spiders, jellyfish, crocodiles, and even carnivorous koala bears that drop down from the trees. It's probably no surprise to learn then, that the prehistoric wildlife here was just as deadly. But of all the animals you might think you had to fear, you probably wouldn't expect that Australia once had demon ducks. The demon ducks are known by a few names, including thunderbirds and mihirungs, based on an aboriginal name for giant emus. The scientific name for these large birds is Dromornithidae, and they lived from at least 34 million years ago until just 45,000 years ago, meaning they would still have been around when humans arrived in Australia. Fortunately for these ancient people, the flightless demon ducks of prehistoric Australia were herbivorous. Nevertheless, they were pretty enormous and intimidating herbivores, with the largest known species, called Dromornis sturtoni, standing at an estimated 3 metres tall, or 9.8 feet, and with a mass of up to 584 kilograms, or nearly 1,300 pounds. This size makes it potentially the most massive bird that has ever lived, heavier even than the moa of ancient New Zealand and potentially the elephant birds of Madagascar, though the biggest moa likely still stood a little taller. These giant demon ducks were somewhat varied in their dimensions and anatomy. The various species included within the genus Dromornis were generally very robust in their skull anatomy and in the bones of their bodies, with massive and powerful hind limbs to support their immense weight, whereas the genus Ilbandornis had very slender and gracile limbs, and was probably quite a fast runner. The smallest known demon duck was the genus Barrawatornis, though they were still the size of cassowaries, which are certainly not birds you want to mess with. The Dromornithid species Geniornis newtoni is the youngest of these birds and the only one to survive into the late Pleistocene epoch, when humans made it to Australia. This species had moderately slender limbs that were relatively long, and although it wasn't as large as Dromornis sturtoni, Geniornis still stood more than 2 metres in height, or about 7.1 feet. Recent expeditions to fossil sites in South Australia have revealed a great deal about the anatomy of this particular giant bird's skull and how exactly they would have fed. The demon ducks are well established to have been primarily herbivorous animals, with the discovery of polished rocks associated with their stomach regions indicating they were likely swallowing them to aid in grinding up soft vegetation. Plus, the general anatomy of their beaks does not look at all like carnivorous birds. The recent discoveries of much better preserved and more complete skulls from Geniornis further confirm the herbivorous diets of the Mihirungs, and indicate that this species at least was feeding in aquatic environments such as lakes and rivers, which is what you'd expect from something called a demon duck. Geniornis shows various adaptations of the skull that would have prevented water from entering the ear canals and nasal cavity, and so it likely would have submerged its head to feed on slippery aquatic vegetation. The new fossils also showed that the large birds had a very wide gape, as well as independent and very fine control over the movement of the upper and lower jaws, meaning they could have manipulated food items held at the tip of their beak with ease. Combined with the discovery that they had very complex musculature relating to tongue movements, this suggests that their manipulative abilities were as good as those of modern parrots. The overall shape of Geniornis' skull was also found to be surprisingly goose-like, and differed from that of other Mihirung species, with a wider, more rounded and spatulate-shaped bill compared to Dromornis, which had very deep beaks. So, perhaps even more terrifyingly, you could consider Geniornis to be an enormous demon goose. Australia had it rough. The demon ducks, and now also geese, would therefore likely have been driven to search for bodies of water as well as other food sources such as woodlands in order to feed. The distances they had to travel would likely have increased as Australia started to become more arid beginning in the middle of the Miocene epoch, about 16 to 12 million years ago, around when the Dromornithids were at the peak of their known diversity. This could explain the interesting combination of aquatic feeding habits along with their more terrestrial features, with many clear adaptations in their hind limbs and feet for travelling over the land, and the more slender-legged species potentially being fast runners. You might expect the Mihirungs, as very large flightless birds, to be somewhat related to other examples of such animals in modern-day Australia, such as emus and cassowaries. These modern examples are members of a bird lineage known as the Ratites, which also include ostriches, rheas, and kiwis. However, the Dromornithids were not Ratites, and represent another independent case of giant size and flightlessness convergently evolving in birds. 
The exact evolutionary relationships of dromornithids to other birds has been the subject of a great deal of debate and controversy among the paleontologists who study these animals. And though they were at first considered close relatives to the ratites, they have also been considered relatives of another giant extinct flightless bird, Gastornis, the so-called terror duck, which you might remember from Walking with Beasts, or perhaps my other video on it. Other studies have alternatively found them to be either more closely related to the Galliforms, so demon chickens, or to the Anseriforms, the lineage that includes waterfowl such as ducks. The most recent studies into their evolutionary placement now find them to be closest to the screamers of South America, and therefore members of the Anseriform order. So they truly were demon ducks after all, and not demon chickens. We've also learned some fascinating things about how these gigantic birds may have behaved. Fossil sites in Australia's Northern Territory have yielded the remains of multiple individuals of the biggest known Mihirung species, Dromornis sturtoni, which we looked at earlier. By analysing the shape and sizes of the bones from different individuals representing a single population, paleontologists were able to show that Dromornis was sexually dimorphic, with the males being significantly more robust in their skeletons than the females. Males were also slightly taller than the females, and also would have been much heavier. From this evidence of sexual dimorphism, as well as other features of the skeletons, paleontologists have inferred some interesting behaviours for these animals. They suggest that Dromornis would have been monogamous, having long-term partners as is generally the case in the waterfowl subfamily Anserinae, which includes ducks, geese and swans. Also similar to Anserinae, they propose that Dromornis would have had mutual displays, with both males and females engaging in courtship rituals, and that they would also have shared parental care of nests and chicks, as well as aggressively defending the nests. I would not have liked to make a nearly 10 foot tall demon duck angry, so my advice to any time travellers would be to stay very, very far away from any Dromornithid nests. It seems likely that the Dromornis females would have been responsible for the actual nest incubation as they were lighter than the males and so could have kept the eggs warm without the risk of breaking them. This contrasts with the case in most of the ratites, in which the smaller males are the ones that incubate. So, although they were very big and very terrifying, the demon ducks might have behaved and reproduced an awful lot like modern ducks and geese. Not to say that modern geese can't also be terrifying, as we all know. Another interesting aspect of demon duck behaviour that was only very recently discovered is that at least some species had casks on their heads. Casks are display features found in various modern birds, such as cassowaries, hornbills and helmeted guinea fowl. The Dromornithid species we're talking about here is Geniornis again, as the same study that describes their updated, more goose-like beak appearance also documents the presence of a low triangular shaped cask on the top surface of the upper beak, close to the eyes. This cask might have been a sexual display feature, perhaps being brightly coloured in life, suggesting the potential for more complex reproductive and display behaviours in these animals. One of the most fascinating aspects of the demon ducks is the fact that they lived until recently enough that ancient humans would have encountered them. We actually have a few tantalising hints at human interactions with Dromornithids, and though you may expect that something called a demon duck would pose a rather terrifying danger to these ancient people, it seems that the opposite was actually true. Based on the discoveries of ancient eggshell fragments belonging to the latest surviving species of the Mihirungs, Geniornis, we know that people were cooking their eggs 50,000 years ago. Thousands of sites across Australia yield the remains of eggs of ancient birds that show undeniable evidence of having been cooked by humans. Charring is visible on many of the shells, plus the amino acid signatures of the eggs are consistent with contact between the eggs and hot embers. Such close contact therefore rules out natural bushfires, and instead confirms that these eggs were being placed in human-made hearths. Many of the eggs coming from these ancient human cooking sites can be confidently identified as coming from emus. Emu eggs started to become a human delicacy around 55,000 years ago, and they continue to be found in deposits dating all the way through to modern times. However, some of these sites also yield a second type of eggshell, which has recently been confirmed as belonging to Geniornis. These eggs only display signs of being cooked during a relatively narrow time frame, sometime between about 54 and 47,000 years ago. These dates are consistent with what we currently understand about the spread of people across Australia, with the oldest confirmed arrival time for humans on the landmass at approximately 65,000 years ago. There isn't any known evidence of humans interacting directly with adult genuineness individuals, archaeological sites don't preserve any signs of killings of these animals, 
and as far as we know there aren't any human-made modifications to any of the skeletons of Jenny Ornis. So this might mean that people only took their eggs, rather than contending with the fully grown demon ducks. This could be a comparable case to what ancient people in Africa were doing with ostriches. Ostrich bones are very rarely discovered at archaeological sites, but their eggshells have been found in many sites occupied by humans since at least the Middle Stone Age. Ostrich eggs have all kinds of uses, being used to make beads and also modified to act as water containers. So perhaps the ancient Australians might have done similar things with their demon duck eggs. The exploitation of the Dromornithid eggs was likely incredibly destructive to these giant birds. The harvesting of their eggs would have dramatically decreased their reproductive success, coupled with the other widespread changes to the ecosystems of Australia that were taking place at this time due to shifts in the climate, it seems very likely that human pressure was a major contributing factor in the eventual disappearance of this lineage that had lived for more than 30 million years. There's a bit more possible evidence that has been used to infer human interactions with Jenny Ornis, as rock art has been discovered that's been claimed to depict these giant ducks. Found at a rock shelter site in Australia's Northern Territory, this rock art clearly displays two birds, one of which has a long, thick neck with a rather heavy and triangular head at the end that's equipped with a robust and rounded beak. When researchers published on this site in 2011, they therefore argued that these specific features made it very likely that the painting depicted Jenny Ornis, and that it therefore either must have been made more than 45,000 years ago, or proves that Jenny Ornis actually survived until much more recently than this. It's definitely a very appealing idea, and the fact that it's painted with a spear sticking into it is very intriguing. However, other researchers have since reanalyzed the shape of the head and body of this depiction, and found that it's far from certain to be Jenny Ornis. Looking at other rock art depictions of Australian birds, scientists found that they can all look quite loosely like various different species, so they cannot confidently identify the supposed Jenny Ornis artwork. Plus, other studies have also looked at the geochemistry of the rock face, finding that it was only exposed after the overhanging rock collapsed nearly 14,000 years ago, so the paintings must have been done since this time, long after Jenny Ornis seems to have gone extinct. It's therefore much more likely to depict either an emu or a magpie goose than Jenny Ornis, but nevertheless, it's still a fascinating glimpse into the past. So that's the story of the demon ducks of prehistoric Australia. They were absolutely fascinating creatures, if slightly terrifying, and would have been rather magnificent to see in life. Although you definitely wouldn't have wanted to get on the wrong side of those beaks. I hope you enjoyed learning about these fantastic prehistoric animals. If you'd like to learn more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.